Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Inside Out Northwest with me, JC Normand. Tonight, celebrating Diane Oxbury, how her investigative journalism led to real change. The most significant piece of progress we've made is the introduction of a, a national database uh, for taxi drivers and private hire drivers who've had the licenses either refused or revoked. How her final report for us revealed an uncertain future for police horses. Over the last few years, we've seen massive budget cuts across the uh, across the service, and most sides no exception. And how her legacy on Inside Out will be remembered by Diane's good friend Tony Livesey. For me, she was a genuine celebrity, but for her, she was always just Diane. In 2017, you might remember that Diane investigated how many drivers have been applying for taxi licenses here in the Northwest despite having criminal records. As a result of that film, a database has been set up which will make it safer for passengers. This week, Parliament debates whether that should be a national requirement. Back in 2017, Diane made a programme exposing the differing licensing standards between local authorities in the North West. We found out that across the region, one in five drivers applying to the Disclosure and Barring Service had previous convictions, some for serious sexual offences. Nevertheless, through a Freedom of Information request, we found out that six councils in the North West had approved some of these licences. People responsible for licensing drivers like John Gregory said that if there were concerns about a driver, the council only had the powers to deal with drivers from their own area. There's no national information sharing network, so if we refused a license to an individual here and he then went to Birmingham to apply for a license, unless Birmingham actually picked the phone up and knew that he'd been a driver with us previously, then it's unlikely that they would make that check with us. MP Andrew Gwynn called for an urgent debate on the issue in Parliament. We now have a problem in the northwest of England where one particular local authority is handing out hackney taxi uh, licences like Sweeties. The 2015 Deregulation Act made it simpler for drivers to obtain a licence in one town but to work in another where the licensing rules may be stricter. This meant passengers had been vulnerable to attacks. A number of drivers are holding convictions for quite serious crimes, including violent um, assault, grievous bodily harm and others. So what's happened since Diane's report? We went to find out. The most significant piece of progress we've made is the introduction of a, a national database uh, for taxi drivers and private hire drivers who've had the licenses either refused or revoked. And I remember watching the, the, the documentary back and thinking, well, why are we waiting for somebody else to do it? Why don't we do it ourselves? The office is now a national hub and a new database has been established to share information and crack down on individuals trying to conceal their past. It's been funded by the local government association. Um, it's now rolled out live nationally. So every application that we get now for, for either for a new licence or for the renewal of a licence, we will check against the database to make sure that we're not granting licences to individuals who've been refused in other boroughs. We asked John how people were able to slip through the net in the past. I'll give you an example. We granted a licence um, to an individual who previously had a licence with another council. Um, he'd had that licence revoked because a female passenger in his taxi made a complaint that he'd acted in a sexually inappropriate way towards her in the taxi. Um, it, it didn't go to the police, she didn't want the police involved in that investigation, but the council determined that he wasn't fit and proper. He came to us to apply for a licence and we asked people to declare have they had a licence anywhere else and he lied on his application form, he said he hadn't. Of course his DBS was clear, so the officers carried out the check on the individual. As far as they were aware, everything was okay. Fortunately, he only had that licence for two or three weeks. He was only driving for two or three weeks before we became aware through, through, through some, some other information about what had happened in the other authority. And we, we acted immediately to revoke that licence and take it off. That, this database would immediately prevent that from happening. The Susie Lamplew Trust is a leading personal safety charity. They've worked with victims, including survivors of the Rotherham child sexual exploitation scandal. 
we see the whole spectrum of behaviours and the impacts that they cause. And these manifest in different um, ways and have different impact on those victims and that might be emotional trauma, it might be physical violence and that might affect people for the rest of their lives and, and how they go about their lives, whether they feel happy in public spaces using those forms of transport again. Uh, and while we know that the majority of drivers are of course reputable and safe and, and doing their jobs perfectly well, what we want to see is legislation that filters out those who are unfortunately using, misusing their position of trust. John explains what would happen if an individual is flagged up. It's down to that authority to contact the first authority and say, why has this individual had his licence revoked? What's the reason behind your decision? Um, and then it's down to local authorities sharing that information with each other. Do I think that, that people don't deserve a second chance? No, I don't think that at all. But the purpose of a licensing regime isn't to allow people to work, it's to protect the public. So, so local authorities need to have a common standard to work to, a common standard that's applied across the board. Some of the current licensing laws date back to 1847. The legislation is long overdue for reform. At the moment, subscription to the database is voluntary. However, a private member's bill recommending it be made a compulsory legal requirement is currently going through the House of Commons. But the bill was blocked at previous readings. Licensing of taxis and private hire vehicles. Under parliamentary procedure, the proposed law was halted in its tracks, as it only takes one MP to call out object. On behalf of the member, I beg to move. Yeah. Objection taken. Not debate to be resumed. What day? That MP was Sir Christopher Chope. He's also blocked other private members' bills, such as upskirting. Okay. Objection taken. Second read. The Conservative MP, Sir Christopher Chope, uttered that one word, object. Many of his colleagues cried shame. We asked several times for a comment on his objections to the taxi and private hire bill, but have received no response. In the comments, he's previously said the following. I've got a number of concerns about this bill, uh, because uh, like a lot of uh, bills with a good intention, I think this is actually seeking to have a disproportionate remedy uh, to the problem which is identified. In other words, we're not talking about offences, but we're talking about conduct which could, if there had been a prosecution, have amounted uh, to an offence. How oppressive is that? Well, we're really disappointed that the, there's been opposition to this bill because it would have been an important step towards legislating for safer uh, private hire and taxi licensing, which is what we're advocating and what is urgently needed. But as a personal safety charity, we would absolutely say that reports are as important to record as convictions because they build up a picture of concerning behaviour over time. And we know that it can take some time for reports to proceed to conviction stage. And we would want licensing officers to have all the relevant information available to them to weigh up that balance of risk, bearing in mind the vulnerability of a passenger. The bill is due to be debated again in the House of Commons this Friday. Despite the setbacks with the private members bill, we've also asked the Department for Transport for a comment. However, they declined to speak on camera and instead we were given this statement. Taxis and private hire vehicles provide a vital community service, but we must ensure passenger safety is paramount especially in regard to the most vulnerable in society. We supported the private member's bill to bring in a national register of refused or revoked drivers, and a similar measure was recommended as part of the task and finish report. But there was still no official comment on when or if this might become a legal requirement. We're doing as much as we possibly can do as local authorities and collectively as a combined authority. Um, it does need, however, some changes to legislation um, to sort of back that, back that work up as well. Saskia says they will continue to push for a change in the law. We believe there are significant safety gaps in the current procedures that are required, um, which are putting passengers at risk. The fact that passengers are essentially in a locked vehicle with a stranger, often alone, often travelling through areas they're unfamiliar with, poses a level of vulnerability which makes more urgent the need to reform safety checks on drivers. Once authorities start using it regularly, there'll be a few people start coming out of the system because 
they've not been honest in the application that they've made. Regardless of any delays, it's now believed that following Diane's original investigation, the industry will soon be made safer for passengers across the country. For over a century now, horses have played a crucial role in frontline policing. In fact, the first mounted unit outside London was based here in the northwest. But as police budgets have been cut, the future of their horses has been in jeopardy. As Diane discovered in her final report for Inside Out, Merseyside may have found a solution which could get rolled out across the UK. For over 130 years, the police horses of Merseyside have been patrolling the city. From riots to royal visits, their role today proving just as important as ever with protests and public order situations being some of the most challenging aspects of their job. Go on then, go around, that's him. They've also had a positive impact on public engagement. Do you want to say hello? Oh, I'll smooth them over here. I'll go ahead, but... <laughs> People are six times more likely to engage with an officer on horseback than an officer on foot, according to research by the University of Oxford. Do you stroke him? And stroke him on there. It won't, won't bite you then. <laughs> but with £17 million slashed from the force's budget over the last three years, the future of this vital resource looked in doubt, unless extra funding could be found. So, in a bid to keep the mounted unit operational, Merseyside Police have launched the Stand Tall campaign a scheme offering corporate sponsorship as an alternative way of funding the unit. Sergeant Danny Harris has been a police officer on Merseyside for 17 years. He now works in the mounted unit, which has been cut by 50% in the last 12 months. So tell me a bit about this Stand Tall campaign. What is it? Uh, obviously, over the last few years, we've seen massive budget cuts across the uh, across the service, and Merseyside's no exception. Um, so we're basically looking to corporate sponsorship to support the uh, the care of the horses. The mounted unit was under threat um, for a significant time, um, and the the powers that be have taken the decision that the, there is still a value in the mounted uh, assets. It's not to facilitate the, the wages of police officers. Um, it's the costs of, of running, uh, veterinary care, feed, things like that, and bedding. It is quite an unusual move, though, isn't it? Corporate sponsorship within the police force. It is unusual, but it's a sign of the times that, that we're facing. The austerity measures have, have hit the service hard, and the alternative is basically the, the closure of the department and, and the loss of mounted assets to Merseyside communities and, and police operations. A report into police funding published last September confirmed that Merseyside is the third worst hit force across England and Wales. Other forces across the region have also been hit hard. It costs Merseyside police £200,000 a year to maintain their mounted section. And while the horses are considered a valuable asset, funding is now desperately needed in other areas of frontline policing. These horses and this mounted branch offers a really vital role in policing. It's not just ceremonial, it's not just match days, it's much more than that. Absolutely. Um, a horse is basically equivalent to 12 foot officers in any public order situation. It's not just those high profile situations that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We are basically bobbies on the beat. But I follow the branch on, on Twitter yeah. and quite often you will post that when officers are out on patrol, that they catch shoplifters, they get involved in all sorts of things, don't they? It always makes me smile a bit when you stop a motorist for something or to give advice and they're like, I didn't think you could stop us. We're, we're police officers with police powers, we have powers of arrest, the same as any other police officer. Um, it's just that this is our vehicle of choice for, for petroleum. <laughs> I'll get your seatbelt. Back at the training centre, only a few horses will have what it takes for a career in the police. After a four-week probation period, the horses spend up to 18 months in intensive training before they become fully operational. 
when the training is ramped up and you're doing public order and you're doing yeah. really hostile environments, sometimes fire is used, yeah. how do you reassure people that none of that is particularly stressful for the horse? The animal welfare is, is paramount. So yes, we want them to do a job, but as I say, we'd never put them in a situation where the horse is unduly distressed. Horses have been put through their paces here at the training centre in Allerton for the last 80 years. The modern riding school and stables adjoin the training school at Manor Avenue. Whoops, said Daisy. Every horse must have daily exercise. And unless there is some special duty, they do a 12-mile patrol of the city streets. The rigorous training regime the horses are put through remains much the same today. The horses undergo riot, pyrotechnic and petrol bomb training. They're taught to go forward into unknown situations and to be calm and responsive in large crowds. Merseyside police aren't the only force whose mounted units are under threat. We've discovered through freedom of information requests that 50% of forces in England that previously had a mounted section have now disbanded them. Merseyside police are the first force to introduce corporate sponsorship. But some have questioned whether funding in this way could affect impartiality. If you have corporations or businesses or bodies sponsoring yeah. you, what about that conflict of interest? Will they be treated potentially the same way as anybody else would be? Any potential sponsor is vetted by the force and the force deems whether they're suitable to support us or not. Um, and you know there's, there's quite clear guidelines as to what we do and don't do and it's not a case of you pay your money and we turn up at you know whatever dinner you're having or anything like that. You basically pay and there's a package available that supports the mounted. So your money funds one of these? Yes. Hopefully for a long time. <laughs> The first company to take up one of these sponsorship packages is Everton Football Club. Why have you decided that you want to sponsor a police horse as, as Everton Football Club? Well, they're, they're, obviously we're one of the perhaps the biggest users of the, of the mounted department, the, the, the football grounds. And once we got the call from the, the Stand Tall campaign, it was a two second decision. So that they are very much part of our match day and we very much want them to stay a part of our match day. So for us it was it was a simple answer, yes, certainly we'll sponsor one of the horses. What would it mean to you if the mounted branch were disbanded? It just wouldn't feel the same, and I think that'll be, that'll be a sad day, as it would for any, any part of the police force, when they turn up and say, I'm sorry, we can't come. While match day patrols have been the most common duty they've performed across Liverpool, the wider role these horses play in policing is undeniable. Merseyside Police are hoping to raise as much as £200,000 a year to pay for the cost of their upkeep. Since the launch of the Stand Tall campaign on Merseyside, other forces across the country are now looking at corporate sponsorship of their horses to help raise vital extra funds. If these schemes are successful, the future of these four-legged crime fighters could be secured for years to come. For five years, Diane presented Inside Out Northwest. She took over from Tony Livesey, who now has his own daytime programme on BBC Five Live. Here, he pays tribute to his good friend and reminds us just what a talented presenter and broadcaster she really was. I first started working with Diane in 2006 and I was really excited to do that. For me, she was a genuine celebrity, but for her, she was always just Diane funny, honest, and an absolute natural on camera. Now, I need to let you into a little secret. I've been working with Motto all day, but he and these legs, of course, don't belong to me. They belong to the owner, who is Diane. Good evening. So let's see how good you are then, Mush. Mush? Mush, Mush. You've learnt a lot on this horsey story, haven't you? My tip to you is if he gives you a tip, you don't take it. Are Come on, Motto. Mush is mushing. 
Thank you, See, go you're, some. You're not a bad musher. If only we had some more sound on that clip. <laughs> yeah. Motto what? was a little windy today. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was yeah. Motto, it could have been Tony, who knows? <laughs> oh, that was really unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Diane first came to the public's attention in the early 90s, presenting children's TV and also as a Radio 1 breakfast presenter. She became best known, of course, as the weather presenter on Northwest Tonight. Then in 2013, she took over presenting duties on Inside Out Northwest. Hello and welcome to a new series of Inside Out with me, Diane Oxbury. Diane loved animals, and if there was an opportunity to make a film about them, she took it. Oh, I tell you, I like it. You get a real proper feel of horsepower, though, don't you? Of course, you always see the ears turning around in, in all directions. Hello. Picking up. A rhino just snuck up on me. Oh, yeah, she wants a cuddle. <laughs> she wants a cuddle. <laughs> they pack some punch, don't they? Oh, they do. You know. I'm, I am quite surprised at just how physical they are. It's like giving children medicine they don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> giving kids medicine is easier than this. Have you ever had a good boot off one? Oh, yes, I uh have. -huh. You put in the mind. Thank you. Oh, Lord. There's something about them which you, <laughs> you have a sharp intake of breath. As a presenter on Inside Out, you could be asked to do anything and die never shied away. She'd ask the serious questions and do the difficult stories. How gangs exploit young and vulnerable people to transport and sell drugs across county boundaries. Some people will be watching this and they'll be saying, you're a monster, you're a monster for using those children. No, I was a monster and I can't deny that. No one's the guaranteed winner of anything. Well, I hear what you say. Um, unfortunately... But that's so obvious. Someone is delivering that through the door and it's branded, it's labelled. You're talking about other organisations and other agencies being involved. The postman or the postwoman is the person who walks up the drive and puts it through the door. And it's so transparent. Well, it's not so transparent. I mean, that, that's the whole point. It is, though, Tony. A lot of it is. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of Best Regional Story is Inside Out Northwest, Who's Driving You Home? And those stories were often recognised by her peers as she won awards for her investigative work. Considering the company that we're in and we're such a small team, it's just a delight to win this award. We're absolutely thrilled to take this one home. Our brief is surprising stories from extraordinary people and as a presenter and reporter on this show, for me it's just an absolute, it's an honour to be able to bring their stories because some of our stories really need to be told. So thank you very much. One of the key roles of being a presenter is doing what the director asks and rising to a challenge. And Diane was definitely challenged. 90 miles an hour, Hurricane Force 12. Powerful enough to uproot trees and destroy buildings. It's a relief when it's over. Way. Yay! <laughs> into freezing stormy water is one of the most dangerous things you can do and the effects on your body are dramatic. The shock of the cold will make you gasp, your breathing will become rapid and chaotic. You become disorientated not knowing which way is up or down. Diane didn't like heights so when asked to climb 200 feet to the top of the air traffic control tower at Manchester Airport wasn't just a physical test of her fitness, but it took guts as well. Of course, she did it in good spirit. The control tower at Manchester Airport is the most modern in the country. It stands at a massive 60 metres high. Kevin Edmonds is watch manager, and it's his responsibility to make sure everything is running smoothly in the control tower. We had a look at the fire escape at, uh, in the control tower, which is 17 floors high. And as soon as the director saw that, he wanted uh, Diane to uh, climb those stairs. And this is the long way up. See you in a minute. Or a few minutes, actually. I must admit, I can't remember how many steps it is now, because it's a long time since I've come up these stairs myself. But to think Diane started from the bottom, took her shoes off, and then walked all the way up and then continued her presentation at the top. I think that's pretty impressive. One floor. Oh, 
Well, I removed my shoes 18 floors later. I'm a bit out of breath. The view had better be worth it. And uh, we just gave the words of encouragement from up here, which I guess in another way you could call heckling. We've seen that Diane loved working with animals and horses in particular were her favourite. Coincidentally, Diane's first and last films for Inside Out were both about horses. Her arrival at the Merseyside Mounted Police Department made a big impression. I found out that Diane was going to be presenting it and uh, obviously I've seen Diane for, for years on Inside Out and Northwest tonight and uh, yeah, I was pretty nervous but totally starstruck when she landed but she was, uh, she was lovely, really, really nice lady. And horses are free-thinking animals so it was uh, not all to plan. Some of our horses had different ideas on the day. If these sponsorship schemes prove successful, if you could stop doing that, that would just be great. <laughs> Once more round. Yeah, we had to go round four or five times, I think, and uh, a few changes. Just, uh, I think it was more for Di to stay on the horse and, uh, and have a bit of a jolly than, than do anything, uh, than get the lines right. <laughs> Diane had to be so many things all at once. She once joked that she had more jobs than Barbie. One thing certain, she was prepared for anything and took everything in her stride. Hello, York. 40 minutes late, the internet doesn't work, so we can't find out where the next train goes from and even when it goes. Is there another train? Do I even want to get on another train? Goodbye. This week on Inside Out Northwest. Did we still have a pigeon? We still have a pigeon. <laughs> Look at this squirrel, he's awesome. It's an empty bucket, I'm afraid. There's no tea right now. Diane certainly had a fun side, but the reason she was so respected was her ability to empathise with the people she met. Sometimes, in an interview, people allow us to see them at their most vulnerable, and Diane never forgot that they were often sharing very painful memories. 17-year-old Harry Dubois collapsed and died while watching television at home with his father in Altrincham. Mario and Debbie Dubois remember Diane for her compassion. She genuinely spent time with us, got to know the story, got to know us a little bit more, um, was caring and just the humane about it. You know, about a week after the interview, um, some flowers arrived at our home with a card and a note from Di and from Lawrence, the um, producer. And it was lovely, wasn't it? And mm. she said, you know, thank you for sharing Harry's story. Thank you for telling us and, and how much it had impacted her and how, um, how she could feel our pain. But she hoped that they told the story sensitively and that it would make a difference. And that, that mm. was really touching. Diane took on so many roles in life, but of course she was devoted most of all to her husband, Ian, and her two children. The thing about Diane, she was so famous here in the Northwest. When you walked down the street with her, it was like being with royalty, but she never let it go to her head. She was down to earth off camera as she was on it. For me, she was a, a wonderful friend, a wonderful colleague, and as you know, someone who could always make you smile. And that, in this world, is priceless. Diane Oxbury, a remarkable colleague, a good friend, will miss her so much.